This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 186, and we had a terrific guest join us again this week, and a repeat guest, Andrew Howlam joined us. And uh, we're recording this on the day that his most recent book was released called Balanced, How to Invest and Spend for Happiness, Health, and Wealth, which I I dropped you a note after I read it saying, not only is this a good book, but it's a really important book for people to read. I think he he nailed it. And this was a terrific conversation about that. He nailed it. And it's like when I, he he sent me an advanced copy of the book quite a while ago now, and I have a little cover blurb, like we mentioned in a, in a previous episode, uh, which was that, that was cool. But I, I read his book and it was after last year where, or during last year when we were we were ourselves doing a deep dive on happiness and the relationship between money and, and life evaluation and all that kind of stuff. And his book just does such a good job capturing all of that research and, and positioning in a way that, that makes a ton of practical sense. So I, de- definitely a, a valuable book for people to read and very much in line with the findings that we came out with when we dug into all the same research. So this book balance is his third book, but as he described, he's actually written effectively five books since the first two millionaire teacher and millionaire expat have both had updated versions released. And he joined us back in episode 99. So if you want to hear more of our past conversation, you can check that out. Andrew's Canadian raised like you in British Columbia. And he was telling us he writes a weekly column for another asset manager uh, called Asset Builder, which is based in Texas, and he's a monthly contributor to the Globe and Mail. And he speaks speaks all over the place. He's been, been a, a sought after speaker for for a very long time, um, and and it comes across like you know when he's when he's talking, yeah. it's like you can you can tell that he you can tell that he's a pro. Um, but he's he's a great guy too. Like uh, we, we've spoken to him twice for the podcast now i've corresponded with him a bunch on on just other stuff uh like for articles that he's working on or, or the book uh all, all that stuff and uh he just he seems like a fantastic guy like uh be and it, be good to meet him interesting in lifestyle too like like oh. he was telling us how many speaking gigs he does and the books and he he's a, like lives a nomadic lifestyle he's all over the world where he lives it's amazing it's amazing so Anything to add, Ben? No, let's go ahead to the episode with Andrew. Uh, Andrew Helm, welcome back to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thanks so much, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Andrew, because of the content of your book that actually is officially released today, we're going to flip our our usual format. Uh, We usually ask how you define success in your life as a final question, but I'm going to ask first, in, in your view, what are the four quadrants of a successful life? Relationships are one key. Uh, the second would be money. I mean, we need to have enough money. So I say enough money would be, you know, obviously a, a roof over our heads, enough money for us to be able to save for our future, good healthy food, that sort of thing. And a little bit of money for, you know, spending on cool experiences, uh, health, is another important aspect and then a sense of purpose. So yeah, I view success as a four-legged table. And do you think in general, people are good at balancing all four? I think it's hard because I think once we start to focus on one, we can start to sometimes drop the balls in other areas. So, you know, I would notice this when I, and I, and I mentioned this in the book balance, and this was just very anecdotal, but I would be giving talks at corporations and I would be having dinners with CEOs of those companies and recognize that not a traditional sense, they were very successful. They seem to have, uh, they had a lot of money, you know, they earned a lot of money and they had a a high status position, but often I would notice that they weren't as satisfied overall with life as you might expect. In a lot of cases, I think it was just the drive to succeed and to really excel in one area had them dropping the ball in other areas. And those other two areas were often health and, uh, and their relationships, the time they were spending with people that they, that they loved. One of the parts of your book I appreciated the most, Andrew, was when you talked about asking the question, why? 
and the importance of that in making decisions. So what do you think people can do to reflect on the why behind what they're doing with both their money and their time? Yeah, it's such an important question, I think, Cameron, to ask, because, you know, as I mentioned in that book, when, when you ask someone why they do anything, like anything, you know, why are you getting that degree? Or why are you going to the bathroom? Um, <laughs> why are you deciding to run a marathon? Whatever it is, invariably, if you continue to dig with why, the response will come down to something related to life satisfaction, like they'll want to feel happy, safe, or secure or good. And so I think what's really important is to try to recognize what it is that really allows us to enhance our life satisfaction. And, and what Daniel Kahneman says, you know, the behavioral economist uh, who won uh, a Nobel Prize, he, he suggests that we don't really know what makes us happy in the future. Like we think we know what makes us happy, but we're really bad at predicting what will make us happy. So I thought bringing the scientific studies, the behavioral based studies on life satisfaction into a, into a single entity like this book would allow people to have a look at perhaps and reflect on some of the things that they're prioritizing in their lives and some of the things that perhaps they should be prioritizing a little bit more. Looking at the behavioral science, instead of entirely going with their gut in terms of what they think will make them happier. One of the things that comes out of that, the, the, the research that you're talking about, uh, is that experiences tend to be more valuable than things because we're, like you mentioned, we're, we're bad at predicting what's going to make us happy. We think things that will make us, things will make us happy, but we adapt to them quickly. Uh, do you think there are any cases where material purchases are worthwhile? Yeah, I think so, Ben. I think if it's something that you're purchasing that will give you an experience. So a lot of things that we buy don't give us a unique experience, like a new phone, for example, um, often an upgraded car doesn't really give you a new experience unless the car you currently have keeps breaking down every day. Uh, so if it's something that you're going to do on a frequent basis and it will give you a different experience or a new experience, then I think that's worthwhile. Like in, in the book, I brought up the example of a friend of mine who I used to bike race with when we were, we were younger. And I met him when I was 19 and he was, I guess, early thirties. And these days, you know, he's, he's heavier. He's got problems with, he's got a few health problems. And I guess as a result of him having knee problems and back problems, he just kept getting heavier because he couldn't get out and he couldn't exercise. It was just painful for him to ride a bike. And he decided to splash out on an e-bike and and it wasn't cheap. You know, this thing was probably, I mean, a good quality e-bike. You know, it can run you six, $7,000. But because he loves cycling and because he uses this thing and he knew that he would, it's helped him tremendously because he's now riding with his friends again. So he's spending time with his friends. I'm spending time with him as we go out and we ride together. Uh, and he's getting fitter. Like he's losing weight. He's getting healthier actually since the book was published he uh he ended up buying another regular bike i mean he'd sold his regular bikes because mm. he just couldn't really ride them anymore so yeah that was a game changer for him in terms of his uh in terms of his life i think also you know if it's something that you're buying that can bring people together you know when we look at studies on life satisfaction so much relates to relationships and so when we're thinking about what we're actually purchasing you know, if somebody is purchasing, say, a cottage by the lake, and they know that they can draw friends and family to that cottage and spend good quality time with them there, and that they're going to do it on a regular basis, like not just for a couple of weeks a year. If it's going to be a couple of weeks a year, it's a waste of money. You might as well rent it, right? So if it's this thing that you are legitimately going to use, and you're going to be able to draw uh, people you love to spend time with, to build memories, uh, I think that's definitely worth money, money worth spending. Hmm. Those are two great examples. So in your book, you talk about a friend of yours who lives in his car by choice and is actually very happy with that arrangement. How do you think people can fight what I think a lot of people live through, which is a desire or even social pressure to buy a big or a bigger house? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. I think one, I think one thing people do think is, and I think incorrectly, is they believe their house is their investment. It's an actual investment. And your house is your shelter. It's not an investment. So bigger house does not equal better investment. You know, if you are buying a big house and your purpose is to, you know, have a series of suites within it, well, then it's an investment or your second home is an actual investment. But the idea of a home being an investment, I think, is one really flawed premise because you have to live somewhere. And so, you know, unless you're going to sell that place and then move to Guatemala, uh, that, that bigger house isn't necessarily considered anything that can give you, you know, some kind of cash flow to put food on the table. But there's another element too, where, you know, when you're upgrading something, there's an interesting German study that was done on life satisfaction pertaining to people upgrading their homes. And a lot of people do that. They'll upgrade their homes thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to feel better in this home. It's just going to make, I'm going to be happier in this place. But then hedonic adaptability takes place there as well. So people get used to whatever it is that they end up purchasing. So if they, are struggling to meet that mortgage, you know, and that big home essentially means that they're not able to save for other things in life. This could ultimately lead to lead to lower levels of life satisfaction. Uh, I sometimes think too of, uh, you know, in the book I talk about, and this is, uh, you know, quite a, a famous study with uh, the town of Rosetto, Pennsylvania, where in the 1800s, people came over from Sicily and they brought their old, school Italian values. And for them, it was considered distasteful to, if you had money, it was fine, but it was considered distasteful to rub it in your, your neighbor's face. So to own like a better car, to own a bigger house, they recognized that it created like a social wedge. And our relationships are, are so, so important. And social wedges are things that we, we never really want to, to anyway, consciously or subconsciously put between us and the people we love and the people we're around. That was interesting because people in Rosetto ended up living a really long time. And one of the reasons, one of the, uh, the theories behind that was just how socially connected everybody was. And a big part of that was if you had money, you know, not to show it off and rub it in the faces of your neighbors. Interestingly, you know, like in the 1980s, when a lot of the younger people in Rosetto ended up getting a a sense of the American dream and building bigger houses, moving into bigger places and getting better cars. It, uh, it fragmented the community. And I say it fragmented it uh, just in that, in as much as the people there no longer live extraordinarily lengthy periods. So, you know, they used to live much longer than they would live in a typical American town. And these days, Rosetto, Pennsylvania, is just like any other place. That's so interesting. Can you describe your, your desert island litmus test for high value material purchases and, and why doing that thought experiment is, uh, is important for people to, to do? Yeah, it's, you know, if you want to buy something and, and I have nothing against, you know, anyone buying something really, really fine if that's what they're into. So if you really want to drive, you know, a top of the line Mercedes Benz or a, or a Porsche, that's awesome if that's your thing. However, you have to ask yourself a really hard question would you still buy it if no one could see it? And that's key. So that's why I call it, the, you know, the desert island litmus test. Like literally, if you lived alone on an island and you had a bunch of roads and sure, you could enjoy that car, but no one else could see it, would you still buy it? So then if we ask ourselves that question, I think most people would say no, because at least in part, we're buying things to impress other people. And the irony there is that we're, we actually don't love and respect people anymore who have better stuff than us. So there's a weird sort of behaviorally primitive aspect of human nature where I'm going to buy this thing in part so that other people can see me, the other people might respect me, but ultimately we don't love or respect anyone more or less based on you know, what they end up owning. In fact, sometimes it draws envy. And I, and I laugh at advertisements that say, you know, hey, live in this place or own this and be the envy of your neighborhood. Envy is not a good thing. You know, envy isn't love. You know, have people love you is cool. Have people respect you is cool. But envy, no, uh, you know, it's not such a good thing. But again, you know, back to that, back to that question. If you love this thing, and you would own it if no one else could see it, awesome. You've bought it for the right reasons. Mm. 
I love that answer. So this next question, I'm going to start it with a quote from your book. There are almost as many index funds or ETFs as there are narcissists on Instagram. Okay, I'm exaggerating. So the question, Andrew, is do you think or how do you think social media contributes to materialistic spending? It's, it's funny because back in the day, you'd, you'd know what your neighbor owned and a few of your friends who were close by, maybe, you know, your colleagues, a couple of your colleagues. But today, with social media, with Facebook, with Instagram, um, the way we're, we're connected is such that, you know, when my friend just bought his daughter a brand new car and they live in Las Vegas, I mean, it was posted on Instagram, it was posted on Facebook, you know, I can see it and all of her friends can see it. Uh, not only friends who are close to us, but, you know, we have something like Instagram or Facebook. Most of those people aren't really our friends. Like, let's be honest, you know, you have these people that have a thousand followers on Instagram, plus, 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 they're not tight with those people, but what do we put on that sort of thing? You know, we put our highlights, we put the, we, the things that we think are going to impress other people. We buy a new car. That's the kind of thing that we're going to put in on, on Facebook or Instagram. And so, yeah, I think it's really, really hard because we're so much more exposed to these material acquisitions where people have these big happy smiles after purchasing something. Um, and it makes it, uh, I think, really difficult for people to, uh, to curb their own spending when they're seeing this, when they're seeing this happening uh, on a far grander scale than they ever would have in the past. I, I can't stand social media personally. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> have Instagram, <laughs> don't have Facebook. And I recently gave up the, uh, control of my LinkedIn account to somebody in our marketing team so that I never have to look at it again. I was going to say, Andy, you're not uh, making this argument to people who put a lot of our possessions on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the last thing I want to do. Even, you know, even the idea of, of traveling, um, you know, put, I mean, and there, there are these benefits to things like Facebook too. Like I've had this love hate relationship with it so many times i thought about ditching it and then there have been these moments where um and i'm really conscious of what i'm putting on facebook typically because i i have a I've, i have a really nomadic lifestyle and so my wife and i are often in some really cool places and we don't need to rub that in the faces of our friends who don't have that opportunity and but yet occasionally i'll i'll post something and it was a moment i was in malaysia on an island called pulau tium and and I, there was just this gorgeous view of the, the bay and I, I posted a picture of Facebook. And this is a place where it's a small, really remote island. And I was on the, the east side, a place called, uh, a place called uh, Juara, a little village called Juara. And I think there are probably about 300 people that live in that village. Supposedly there are 300 people, but honestly, you never, you know, it's one of those places where it's like, where do they live? And it's just all jungle and then these jungle areas and I did post this thing right away. I ended up getting a response from some friends who were uh, that I worked with in Singapore and I didn't know this, but they bought a sailboat and they had sailed it. And this was like quite a, an epic sail. They had sailed it right into that same bay that I'd taken that photograph. And so they're like, they said to me, look, look out into the bay. We're here. And they're the only boat there. Like, this okay, that's cool. And so like I swam out to that, to their boat. Come on. And, I'm completely exhausted. I'm not a great swimmer, but I'm so wasted when I got there, but I was so happy to see them. So yeah, I mean, there are these, these elements that are positive, but uh, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm with you, Ben, and that there probably are more negatives than there are positives associated with social media. That is a very cool story though. Uh, a, a general theme in all of your books, uh, including, including balance is frugality. But are, are there cases where you think being more liberal or generous with spending can make sense? Yeah, I think when you're spending it on an experience, it makes a lot of sense, especially when it's like a novel experience, because it allows us, among other things, one, it allows us to build memories. And so if it's novel, you know, when I, I talk about the campfire story, like, you know, 10, 20 years from now you and Cameron are hanging around a campfire, you guys are not going to talk about the stuff you bought back in 2025. You now, when you're sharing stories, you're going to be sharing like stories of things you did, the fun things, the dumb things, uh, the places you saw, the people you met. And if you're spending money on enhancing those experiences, and sometimes travel can really do that, 
um, or guitar lessons, you know, or like cooking classes. I mean, you don't have to go anywhere to spend money on an alternative experience. And another thing that these experiences do or the money we spend on experiences do is they, they can alter our perception of time. So time is elastic. And when we're young, you know, you're in the eighth grade, that year seemed to go a long time. Like it just seemed to last forever. And, and in part, it's because, you know, one year in the life of a 14 year old is a greater percentage of your lifespan. But there's something else that happens when you're in the eighth grade, you're changing so much. Everything is changing. Your friends are changing. You know, you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and then you're fighting, and then you're, you've got a new friend, new best friend, and then you've got this new teacher, and then you've got all of these different points of reference that allow us to remember what actually happened or allow us to experience what happened. And I'm sure you guys can relate to this. Like when you do travel somewhere, if you go somewhere or do something different and you think to yourself like, wow, okay, I landed here like five days ago, but it seems like it was like two weeks ago. And, and we often think about that because it's all of the novel things that we experience on that vacation that are totally different. So it stretches that perception. So we may not be able to control how long we're living, but sometimes spending money on an alternative experience can stretch our perception of time. And although it may not chronologically allow us to live longer, it allows us to live longer based on our perception, which I think really is the only thing that mm. matters. Very cool. What, what about other, other stuff? Like experiences makes a ton of sense and time perception, that, that aspect is fascinating. But I think in the book, you also give the example of massages that, that you and your wife spend a lot of money on, on massages. Are, are there any other things like that, that, that can be justified, I guess, for splurging? Yeah, I think giving, um, like when we give, especially if it's pro social giving, like we really remember it. And so when I mean pro social giving, I mean, research suggests that you know, when we, when we donate money, we end up feeling better. We end up feeling good. It ends up enhancing our life satisfaction. But what is even more important is when it's what they call pro social. So you actually see the results of what it is you've given. And so it's like one of those things that, for example, my wife and I ended up uh, becoming co-founders of a, a foundation in Cambodia where we went to Cambodia and with a group of other people, we ended up finding a bunch of 10th grade kids who we went to a series of different schools and we put kids through a bunch of tests of sorts, like uh, academic tests. We had a bunch of uh, Cambodians who actually helped us on the ground administer some tests but we were really interested in social tests. So we would ask like, you know, who do you, we would ask all these kids, like name three people that you would go to with a problem. Name three people that um, they really enjoy. Who have, name three people who has a great sense of humor or who's really helpful. And we narrowed this down to a select group of kids and then said to them, hey, this is what we plan to do. We plan to, uh, we want you to initiate some kind of community project and we want to be able to give you some kind of guidance on that. So your community project is something you're doing somehow to better the community. And this is a really, really poor area of uh, Cambodia called Kempong Spu, but there's no running water. There's no electricity. Like these people are really, really poor. I mean, they don't have proper outhouses. They, most of them don't have proper wells for, for good drinking water. But we said to them, you do what you can to work on this project to better the community. We'll guide you along the way. And if you follow through with it, not whether you succeed or whether you fail, but if you follow through with it, we will give you a college education. So we'll pay for that. We'll, we'll, we'll get a house for you and your cohorts. We'll put you up in a place in Phnom Penh, which is the capital city of Cambodia. And we'll ensure that whatever it is that you guys want to do, uh, you'll be able to do it. You don't have to worry about the finances. And this was something that, yeah, this kind of thing costs money. But in terms of an experience, I mean, I'm able to tell you guys about this in so much detail. I mean, we could talk all night about this and there's a, there's a strong reason for that. It's pro-social giving. It's we could actually see the results and we were involved in what it was we were doing and how we were help how we were helping others. It felt awesome for us. And of course they really appreciated it too. So 
it, it doesn't have to be that dramatic where you have to, you know, find your own, have your own foundation. It could just be a, you know, gifting money on Kiva, for example, like where you get to pick someone who wants to borrow money for a small business, wherever that might be in the Philippines or Cuba or Canada or the United States. You can pick your geographic region, you can pick your gender, and you can actually see the person. This is the person. You know, you can see their photo, you can see um, what it is that you're looking for. I, I suggested like getting together with groups of friends and having coffee maybe once a week and each of you picking somebody that you'll, and it's not a donation, it's a loan with Kiva. And so, you know, you'll get most of that, if not all of that money back. Uh, and I think this is an awesome thing to do with our money. It doesn't really cost us anything because like I said, we do get most of it back. So we could just kind of recycle, keep recycling that money through to different entrepreneurs. Incredible. A really interesting part of your book to me was how you described how life satisfaction increases after middle age, which is typically when people have more narrow social network and less focus on status and less material good focus. Question that I thought about while reading your book that I wanted to ask you was, do you think people can get to that place sooner in life? Or is there a certain amount of maturity that comes around middle age that enables you to to have satisfaction from other areas? I think Cameron is difficult, but it's doable. Uh, and I think too, one of the things about, you know, when you get older too, you recognize your own mortality and you start to realize what's really important. But I think that young people can recognize this stuff when they see, when they see the, the science behind life satisfaction, I think it can become a lot clearer to them when they see the science behind, uh, material acquisitions and hedonic adaptability, for example, and how pursuing things won't enhance your life satisfaction, that perhaps you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses uh, is, is a futile quest that doesn't enhance any kind of internal satisfaction long-term. I think once people can see that, it's sort of like uh, you know, a lot of people tell me when I, when I explain to them about, about cars, you know, a lot of people when they get their first job, they borrow a bunch of money and they buy a brand new car. And I know that when I started telling people about Thomas Stanley's research on like, what, do, what does the average millionaire drive? You know, the, did you know that, you know, in 2019, the, the median uh, price that uh, for the most recent car in the United States purchased by millionaires was $35,000. And that most high-end cars are not driven by wealthy people. They're driven by people with high incomes, but also high debts. And it's, it's been interesting over time because I've been a lot of younger people who've said to me, I remember that, like that, I remember that. And now when I see somebody who's young, who's driving a super expensive car, I don't necessarily feel envy for them. I recognize that that person probably doesn't have or might not have a lot of money. That most people that drive super high-end cars, most of them don't. Some do for sure, but most of them don't. And I think then back to your question, when you're looking at research on life satisfaction, although it's probably harder for younger people to be able to put that aside and decide they're going to be true to themselves at a younger age, they're not going to be as influenced by peer and social pressures, although it's more difficult at a younger age in your 20s, 30s, and early 40s. Is it doable? Absolutely. I think it is. Hmm. You, you, you have a table in your book that you did up yourself with the uh the Forbes wealthiest people list. And then you, you found, figured out which cars they, uh, they drove. I yeah. calculated that the median vehicle price was uh, $46,000 for the top, whatever it was, 15 wealthiest people in, uh, in the world. The, the mean was 220,000 because, uh, somebody has a $2.2 .2 million McLaren, but, but, <laughs> but the median was 46,000 that, that stuck with me too. That th those data are fascinating. It's, it's so interesting to me because I mean, we have a condo in Victoria, British Columbia. And if I go down into the parking area, uh, I would say, I would say most of those cars are worth over $46,000. Yeah. And I know for sure that none of them are billionaires. Yeah. Um, I don't even think uh, there'd be too many millionaires of any millionaires down there either. So yeah, it's something it's worth knowing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, Andrew, you had bone cancer in 2009. Did that experience or diagnosis change your outlook on life? It didn't change. It didn't change mine. And I think only because 
I, from a really young age, kind of recognize the one thing, like I'm not that smart, Ben, but I do recognize that I know, and I've always known that I'm going to die. Perhaps it was just no one in my family had ever lived past 62. So no aunts, no uncles, no grandparents. And so I kind of just, I felt that, and I guess early on recognized that life is potentially really short. It's finite for everybody. It's like we all have a terminal illness. And so when I did end up getting cancer, I, I had, I already had a really strong appreciation for, uh, for life. And I think, you know, if you recall what I ended up saying to a, a reporter <laughs> who interviewed me on channel news Asia and basically asked me that very question. And, uh, and I said something just, I just shot from the hip and said something that they edited from that interview. I said that, and, and I regret how I said it, but I don't regret the message. I looked straight at the camera and I said, it doesn't matter how smart somebody's supposed to be. If they rec- if they, if it takes a life threatening illness to recognize that one day you're going to die, then you're an idiot. Uh, and it was harsh, right? I mean, they, they cut that from the interview, but there's, there's so much truth to that just to recognize the importance that not only are we here temporarily and we don't know how long we're going to be here. It could be, we could live well into our nineties or we could be gone next week, but that extends to everyone we know, all of our loved ones. And so the idea of us always being aware of that so that we, and we have gratitude for the time that we have, the experiences we have and the people that we have around us, because we've all lost people. I'm sure you guys have lost some friends and it's been unexpected, healthy people who, for whatever reason, uh, kick the can earlier loved ones. It's just, it's just the reality of life. So I just think it's so important to try to recognize that I, there's a, it probably takes work. I think too, Ben, for, for plenty of people and that's okay. But as long as we're willing to put that work in, and, and this is what I'm, what I'm talking about is when I've, I've read about this, uh, you know, behavioral studies on life threatening illnesses or people have overcome. And for a short period of time, they have cherished life more but it's often usually usually more often than not it's just a short period of time so they recognize and cherish their lives they recognize immortality but it doesn't take that long before they just kind of slip into the same old way of thinking instead of really appreciating everything that they have and everyone they have so i think it's just just something that we probably need to take moments to just just short moments to to reflect on from time to time my, uh, my, go ahead. My, my mom had breast cancer, like a, a, a very serious diagnosis when I was 11 and that was a mortality realization. And it's, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. It, it's good to know that it's good to be mindful of the fact that life is finite, but it's also, it also kind of sucks. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's you, it, it can be a gift as well, though, because you know that um, you know, you've got to also live for the day. I mean, the idea of saving all of your money for tomorrow is yeah. quite foolish because tomorrow might never come. So to have that balance between, like, as I say, have have one eye on today, always have an eye on today and always have an eye on tomorrow. So don't live la vida loca and mm-hmm. not put away money for your future. Make sure that you at least have some kind of balance between the now and the later, because you know, people are living longer and so many people who could end up living well into their nineties and beyond. I, I certainly hope that the three of us do. And that we're, you know, that we're relatively healthy. I, I want to quickly read the quote that you said to that reporter, because uh, the, the way you said it a minute ago, wasn't as uh, not quite as aggressive <laughs> as the way it, it's written in your book. Uh, uh, if, if you need your own life-threatening illness to recognize that one day you're going to die, then you're an idiot. You can't regret that quote too much. That's pretty good. They cut that quote from the interview. That was the only thing that I think they did cut too. Funny. So you mentioned gratitude. How does gratitude contribute to a good life and how can people incorporate gratitude into their lives? You know, it's, you know, I think back to what we were talking about earlier, just reflecting on it. A friend of mine, uh, a fellow by the name of Bill Green, who I met when I was in my 20s. Um, and like a lot of people, he'd been through a lot of ups and downs in life. And he would write these little sticky notes that he would put on his mirror. 
And he would actually say these things. And it, it sounds kind of dorky, but he would write down what he appreciated, like just a little note. And he'd just stick that on the mirror. And he might take one off and then add a new one a few weeks later. And he'd actually say them out loud in the morning. It sounds like, you know, a bizarre ritual, but this was something that helped him. It grounded him. And you know, I reconnected with him recently. I hadn't really spoken to him for years, but reconnected with him and asked him, like, tell me about this. And he says, a lot of people don't think they have time to do that or to do a gratitude journal. But he said, you know, people don't have time not to do that. That's how he put it. And when we're looking at research on gratitude journaling, it doesn't have to be anything dramatic, but just taking some time once a week just to write down what we appreciate. So focus on one thing and then write, you know, half a page in a journal about it. Instead of listing off items, just take one thing, take one person that you just really appreciate having in your life and just writing it down. And, you know, a lot of research has been done on gratitude journaling, and it has a surprisingly long term effect, positive effect on, on people's actual moods, which I think is really cool. Um, there was a study done on people, though, who were suffering from depression. It was the first one. I think it was done in 2017. And, and a lot of people were wondering, like, does this affect people who are actually struggling uh, with depression already. So people, they, you know, went, obviously were going through counseling. They had three groups, one group that was going through the counseling sessions and then a second group that was going through counseling uh, and gratitude journaling. And the third group that wasn't going through anything, but they found that the group that was going through the, with the gratitude journaling plus the counseling ended up uh, far be in a far better place than the people that just went through the counseling. Um, and obviously better than the people that weren't doing anything. So yeah, it's, it's a, I think it's an important thing. And I don't know about you guys, but I've done it from time to time too, where I've had periods in my life that were, I guess, a little bit challenging when I've written things down, like I've written down what it is that I really appreciate, which then allowed me to see and reframe some things in life where a lot of the things that might've been bringing me down or upsetting me, they, uh, they weren't as uh, they weren't necessarily as as epic as I was making them out to be, but it put everything into perspective when I would recognize the things that I was really grateful for, and when you recognize those things, and think about perhaps what your life might be like without them or the difficulties you might have without them, I think then you you really hold tight and appreciate them, and I think too, just that awareness allows you to appreciate other people allows you then to prioritize spending time with people, uh, people that you love and respect, reconnecting with old friends. You know, when you're looking at, um, I know a study that, uh, that Bronnie Wire did, the palliative care nurse in Australia, where she would ask people about the regrets of the dying. And I know Daniel Pink wrote a just, I think just this week is releasing a new book on, uh, on regrets. And, and he and I had an, e an email conversation about that. And, and he was saying, um, now, his research is very much aligned with what palliative care nurse Bronnie Warr found. And it's that when people are in the latter, the la latter stages of life, the things that they regret aren't you know, having more money or buying better cars or a better house. It's, uh, it's relationship-based and not just relationship-based with them and others, but relationship-based with themselves. Like they wish they were truer to themselves from an earlier age. So this brings in that sort of I think Cameron, you mentioned that that U shaped uh, list, that U shaped uh, life satisfaction chart, which shows that life satisfaction ends up you know, high, and it's in a, when we're in our twenties, and then again, it, and then it drops, and then it improves when we're into our fifties. And I don't think we need to do that. Like I think, you know, we can end up embracing gratitude in our twenties and thirties and forties, and the things that we appreciate. Uh, so that we don't end up, I mean, to me, it's, it's a bit of a waste, isn't it? To actually get to your fifties before you're actually feeling uh, true to yourself, great about who you are. We, we have the, uh, the top five regrets of the dying that's in, in our notes here. I'll, I'll read them quick. Uh, people wish they had lived true to their values instead of living the lives that other people expected of them. They wish they hadn't worked so hard. They wish they had the courage to express their feelings they wish they stayed in touch with old friends and they wish they let themselves be happier instead of falling into boring routines. Pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, all relationship-based, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. 
Uh, Andrew, our podcast has an online community, which I know you know about because you've participated in it. Uh, people discuss all kinds of things related to personal finance or investments or decisions that they're making or whatever. How important do you think it is for people to have that kind of support network of like-minded people? I think it is. I think it's really important. You know, I was thinking about, I was thinking about like churches, like uh, Christian churches, mosques, um, Buddhist temples. And these people will have a set of values or an ideology, but if it weren't for their central meeting places, I wonder whether those actual religious beliefs would have perpetuated over time. And so I see these, these online communities as potentially much the same. We've got these like-minded people who are you know, reinforcing whatever their beliefs happen to be amongst themselves. That's really interesting. Um, how do you think index funds contribute to a good life? I think that like it, one of the things that a guy said to me when I first started to invest money is he said, if you become financially literate, you can do the job that you want to do and not have to chase a higher paycheck. And so I think with index funds, there's that essence that if I'm choosing indexes over actively managed products, especially when you look at the fees associated with actively managed products in, in, in a country like Canada, feasibly I could end up with twice as much money when I reach retirement age as I would have with active managed products from a, a major Canadian bank. And so this can allow you to, I think, not necessarily chase a position just for the money. So you can end up doing something where you might be more passionate about it, even though it ends up paying you a little bit less, knowing that if you invest in something like index funds and you're financially literate with respect to your spending, um, yeah, I think that that it can enhance your life satisfaction because you know when you're working, if it's a job that you don't like, you're you're trading, you're basically prostituting yourself. You know, if you have a choice, it's a, it's a shame if you have it if if you don't have a choice, that's one thing. But if you actually have a choice where you could do something that you kind of enjoy, this is awesome. But if you're doing something that you don't like and just chasing that dollar, uh, you're giving away pieces of your life and to uh, to an employer. It's crazy to think about because it probably goes the other way too. Like if, if people think that they can get a higher return with actively managed funds, they, they might feel like they don't need to take the higher paying job, but, but the, data would, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the data would oh, say they're low, yeah. but that's, that's, that might be what they're chasing. It's hard to say, isn't it? Yeah. It's so hard to say. That's just Good one. Point. I just presented one, uh, one angle there. Uh, how do you think an investor should decide whether to manage their own stuff, like become financially literate and, and take the time to, to do their own uh, investments and financial planning uh, versus hiring somebody else to do it. Yeah, I wanted to ask you guys what you guys thought about that, uh, that myself, like that actual question. I would think about, you know, how complicated is your financial situation, number one. So if it's more complicated, then yeah, it's, uh, it can be a better idea to get some help. And then two, emotionally, I mean, do you want to be putting in the time managing your own money? And with a financial advisor too, you also have, it's not just about them helping you with your investments. You know, there's far more to it than that overall holistic financial planning, goal setting. So it, that role is a lot more than I think a lot of people think it is. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with that. I think that there's also an aspect of how how do you value your your time because some people love trying to do this stuff on their own and if yeah. somebody really enjoys it then maybe it wouldn't make sense to uh, to pay for it. Um, whereas if somebody like I personally am happy to pay for like the people I'm I'm not in my office right now as people that are watching on video <laughs> will know because there's <laughs> there's people in my garage which is where my office is uh, replacing our hot water tank. And I'm very happy to pay for stuff like that. So I think if uh, if people want to offload those those tax, I think complexity is huge. Like that, when when you asked how, how would we answer the question, the first thing that I would have said is complexity, which is also the the first thing that you said. And then there's related to that is the the ability, because obviously with more complexity, it becomes like objectively harder to to do. Um, yeah. So I, I would say similar to stuff to to what you said, Andrew. So what questions would you suggest to someone who is hiring an advisor 
What kind of questions do you think they should be asking before they do make that decision? Oh, the, the, some of the, the first question I think would be related to the products that they would be recommending. So index products, ETFs, and only index products and ETFs would be one. You know, I mean, I, I'd written this down in my book and I'll just, I'll list them out here. You know, do you, do you only invest with low cost index funds or ETFs first? How do you earn your money? So is it based on commission? Because if it's based on commission, there's a conflict of interest and we, we don't want an advisor who's getting paid based on commissions or potentially high trailing fees. Uh, does your firm use research to forecast the economy or the market's direction? So that would be a great question to ask because most firms will tell you that they have some kind of proprietary service where they can predict what's going to happen or at least watching the economy and forecasting. If, if they say they have any of the sort, run away. Like that's not the sort of firm that you want to be, you want to be investing in. Ask if you can see a, a model financial plan and portfolio. So if you're sitting down with an advisor, ask them to actually show you what a model portfolio would look like and explain it to you, explain the plan to you. And if they can't explain it in language that you can understand, that's not really going to be a good fit because you have to be able to understand what it is they're expressing. Obviously, credentials help. So you know, we, we all know that you can go to the... You can walk into a major Canadian bank. There can be somebody there who says they're a, a financial advisor or a representative for the bank selling mutual funds. And they've got like a Canadian securities course under their belt, which isn't all that thorough. So you know, something like a certified financial planning certification is worth definitely worth looking at. And I would ask some questions too about, and I guess it's the interview process can work both ways too, where clients can be asking the questions, but advisors should be looking for the right fit as well. But one of the questions I would be asking is like, tell me about your, your financial story. Like, you know, are you somebody who's actually tracking your finances and what's, you know, what you're spending and what are you invested in? I would ask that as well. Do you think people that have financial advisors can afford to take more equity risk than DIY investors because of the behavioral coaching aspect? I think they can afford it, but I don't think they do it. Uh -huh. And I'll, I'll, I'll back that up and I'll say that, you know, I've, I've, I've been looking at a lot of uh, Facebook forums, investment group forums, uh, financial independence groups and such. And most of the people I see are 100% equities. Mm. And I think that 100% equities or maybe they'll have like 90% equities and 10% bonds. And, you know, you've got this period of the last 10 11 years where the markets have essentially just gone up. And so a lot of these people are new investors who haven't necessarily experienced a massive crash. So they don't really know what their risk tolerance is. And so they, they have these really high risk portfolios for, versus let's assume somebody goes to like a firm like yours, you guys are going to do a far more thorough risk assessment with them. And my guess is that far fewer of them are going to be picking hundred percent equities just because they're going to have a broader sense of the historical realities of it i you know when i started with that question i said they could they could afford to go higher risk because they have a gatekeeper like when they freak out there's somebody who can talk them away from the edge talk them away from speculating uh which is which is hugely important because you know i often look at you see portfolios with higher stock market allocations versus bonds we see the historical returns on those and they're higher but it's not necessarily how the portfolio allocation performs. It's how the person performs with that particular portfolio allocation. So when I look at the results for uh, funds in the United States based on Morningstar's asset, when we look at cash flow analysis to see how investors actually are performing in these multi-asset class funds like Vanguard's target retirement funds, they actually behave reasonably well. Um, and and better, in fact, than a lot of investors who are going 100% equities. Wow. So there's that gap, you know, when Morningstar publishes the, the research, their mind, the gap research, like how does the, how do the funds perform and how does the actual investor perform? When looking at, and I remember Morningstar used to make it really quite clear with, with uh, different mutual funds and DFA is one of them. And I always found it really interesting to see how the behavioral gap with DFA funds was a lot lower than it was with, say, Vanguard's individual indexes. 
And I think one of those reasons is that there's a gatekeeper. So with DFA, I mean, traditionally, you haven't been able to just buy them. Like you, you've needed to have a financial advisor to, and that financial advisor also drinks a certain Kool-Aid, right? I mean, trained to understand that uh, and practice the fact that we can't forecast, we shouldn't forecast, we should maintain a consistent allocation. Yep. We, we've drunk that Kool-Aid too. Um, I, I want to follow up on the your comment about all the people that you see in the DIY forums being 100% equity. Do you think that's smart for them? <laughs> I think they they think they understand their tolerance for volatility, Ben, but they don't. Um, mm. Again, like just like with Daniel Kahneman, when he says, we don't know what will actually make us happy in the future, we don't know what will make us scared to death in the future either with respect to market declines. So the idea that, you know, that we could get a, a market decline such as we had in 2000, 2001, 2002, and then that other drop that went down to March of 2003, you know, three, really three straight years of market declines. Um, and then too, you know, looking at can Canadian dollar terms from 2000 to 2013, everybody's favorite stock market right now is the US stock market. Uh, that was everybody's favorite stock market in 2002, right up to that point. Right. But for 13 years, you wouldn't have made you wouldn't have made money measured in Canadian dollars. And uh, and then of course it's probably uh, 14 or 14 and a half years whereby you wouldn't have actually beaten inflation in Canadian dollars either. So that's a long time to wait. And I don't think people really fully respect that when they're investing today because everything has gone up. I think this is pretty easy. They tell me things like, well, I can tolerate volatility because I was able to handle what happened in 2020. When someone says that, you know, they don't understand. Because when someone says that, you're like, you know, that was a blip for a couple of months. And I think the year of 2020 ended up a 20% gain, um, the calendar year growth for that, for the US market anyway. So no, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that most people can handle 100% equities. <laughs> Maybe a maybe a better person to ask is someone who's been investing in value stocks for the last ten years. Another case in point, right? Yeah, I mean, sticking that through. Um, can, can you can you tell a short version of your ghost story from your book? Because I thought that was a brilliant analogy to to think about the personal risk assessment. So, if you ask me on the street, like Andrew, do you believe in ghosts? I'd probably say no. But when I was in Singapore, I took a bunch of kids to an island in Indonesia. And we ended up, it was super remote. We ended up hanging these hammocks in between these trees. We had a, a guide there, an American guide. And we slept the night and I, I woke up in the middle of the night and there was a woman standing beside my hammock who threatened to kill all the kids. And it was a dream, but it was a triple dream. It was a triple dream where like I woke up after begging for my life and begging for the lives of these kids, I woke up sweating. I'm on the equator and, and I'm freezing cold and sweating. I'm freezing cold. It's 30 degrees Celsius in the middle of the night. And I'm cold. And there she was again. And I said, I swear we'll never come back. And she says, never come back. I told you not to come. And it just, it scared the hell out of me. So this happened where I had this triple dream, woke up, was talking to the guide as we were hiking out of there. I told him about it and he was really quiet. And he said, Andrew, um, I, we had a really hard time actually getting a permit to camp there because the locals told us we, we couldn't and that it was haunted. And that what had happened was uh, the Japanese had come through and they had slaughtered an entire village right where we camped. Nobody lived there now. But they'd slaughtered an entire village. And so I said to him, I'm never going back there. So if like I were transported there right now, and I'll say to you, like, if you ask me, Andrew, do you believe in ghosts? I'll say no. But if you transported me there, like Star Trek style, I swear you guys, I would, my bowels would release. I mean, I would, I would go, I would run across those rocks in that jungle, like a man who totally lost his mind and I'd completely wet my pants. Um, so what I think and what I say is completely misaligned with my actual reality. So I will say, I don't believe in ghosts. I will tell you that. I won't tell you that in that jungle if you send me there. But that whole disconnection, I think, happens with people with respect to their tolerance for risk when it comes to their investment portfolios too. Yeah, I can handle 100% equities. Well, when you're given your own metaphorical jungle, 
Uh, no, you probably can't. I think that's that's brilliant. You mentioned target date funds, which prompts me to ask you this question. How do you think investors should decide between, you know, and they're quite widely available now, these one decision, globally diversified, either ETFs or mutual funds, between that and, say, a more complicated portfolio optimized for things like asset location, the value or small cap profitability tilts. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the like the more moving parts for a DIY investor, the more challenging it's going to be. Um, and I've got a friend who's a, a financial advisor who can manage money for his clients, but for his own personal money, even he ends up speculating. And so what he's done is he's recognized this weakness and he's actually given his personal portfolio to uh, one of the guys he works with. So like, I can't do it. I can't do it with my own money. I can do it with my client's money, but I can't do it with mine. So you manage my money for me. And that's somebody who's been through a lot of training, understands market history, understands how, uh, obviously how tempting speculating can be and how detrimental it can be long-term. He gets all that but behaviorally. Uh, he can't actually do it with his own money. So now when we're talking about a typical DIY investor, I would say in most cases, I think most of them would be far better off just with an all-in-one portfolio ETF where there's less for them to do, fewer moving parts, less temptation to speculate. What are some of the things that parents can be doing to get their kids started on saving spending and, and even thinking about all the other stuff that the, the living well stuff. Yeah. My sister used to like split the money into thirds, which can be really common, like for the kids allowance, like you, here's a third that you can spend on, uh, spend on something that you want, anything that you want. Uh, a third would go to charity. The kids would have to pick the charity and then a third that would go into an investment for their future. And, uh, and I've spoken to some parents who've said that when they, they match the, contribution that their child is making to their investments, their children are more encouraged to actually do the investing or to invest that money. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause it's not money that they can see or spend right away, but that little carrot that shows them much like a, like a, a U.S. corporate 401k where, you know, it's, it's a life lesson. So people can end up you know, as a parent, you can match what your child is contributing and hopefully, you know, encourage them to save for the future and get them thinking about that. What's your thoughts around the traditional view of retirement where people have a whole career and then just do a hard stop at the end? When I was in my 20s, I thought that was awesome. I thought that idea was awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and now I recognize that like for me, I continue to work even though uh, theoretically I'm financially independent, but we need a sense of purpose. We need to keep engaged. We need to keep interacting with other people and work in some capacity helps us do that. And research on that suggests that we live longer when we are able to maintain some kind of work-related engagement through our latter years. And what it also does too, I think, Cameron, is it alleviates a lot of financial stress as well. So, you know, if somebody is earning fifteen thousand dollars a year through a part-time gig that they enjoy, you know, based on something like the, you know, I'd say a four percent inflation-adjusted withdrawal rate. I think you need something like $370,000 to throw off uh, $17,000 of annual income or annual spending. Uh, so it alleviates a lot of financial stress too. I think if people feel that they could continue to work, people do live longer as a result of that too. How, uh, how seriously do you think people in Canada for a while, we have people that listen to the podcast all over the world in, in uh, Europe Canada, the United States, and, and elsewhere, people living in countries like uh, or places like that, how seriously do you think they should consider spending a portion of their retirement in lower cost living countries? I think if, you know, it's, it's a good question, Ben, because there are people that will move to a low cost country or spend winters in a low cost country just for the fact that it's cheaper. And I think hmm. that, that should be secondary. I think hmm. that the primary reason to spend time in a, in a in a different country in the winter or move to a low cost country period would have to be experiential. Like you actually mm -hmm. want to experience something new, uh, something novel. Um, 
new cultures, but the money shouldn't necessarily be the top priority because I think a lot of people who end up going down, making that their priority, they think that they're going to end up living a, a life that they would live in Toronto. It'd be like little mini Toronto or little mini New York. And it's not going to be, it's going to be entirely different. So mm-hmm. if they're open to differences and different cultures and they, they like to travel, they like to embrace things that are new and novel. Absolutely. It's awesome. It can be a game changer with respect to retirement. Hmm. What, what hesitations do you hear people having about, about doing that? Um, and how do you respond to those hesitations? Yeah, I think anything that's unknown is frightening for people. And I know that when my wife and I traveled for 17 months in our camper van in Central America, we'd get, we'd get comfortable with the country. But every time we went to another country, another border, we would hesitate. We would be fearful. And it was just because it was, it was unknown. So I think for a lot of people, the unknown can be quite frightening. So if they're going to do it, dip their toe in there, like take a short vacation and then spend a little bit more time and then maybe rent an Airbnb for three or four weeks and get a sense of whether they would actually really enjoy being there Mm -hmm. or not before making a a full-time decision. Makes a lot of sense. All right, Andrew, I'm going to try not to laugh when I ask you this question. I'm already (laughs) laughing. (laughs) The, The word poop makes three appearances that I found in your book and and one appearance for poo. And we were talking about this before we started recording and you said that there's also a fart in there that I I missed when I, when I read it. Now that that was a first for me reading personal finance books. So I just wanted to ask you, do you you think people take themselves too seriously? (laughs) I think think you know the answer to that. You're asking me and I'm just this (laughs) perpetual clown. Um, Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people do. I think it's fun to, just uh, try to embrace, I mean, some people are listening to this are just not going to relate to this, but each day, just try to embrace your inner child with something. You know, I mean, laughter is awesome. Laughter is healing as well. I mean, we heal with laughter. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot of us, as, as we get older, we end up taking ourselves a little bit too seriously and, and we have to be able to laugh. I, I got to say it was strangely refreshing to read, uh, <laughs> to read all those poops and poos in, in a book about money. <laughs> So we, uh, we talked about success at the top of the conversation and also the last time you were on. So I think we'll invert the last question that we normally ask for you. So what is your definition of failure instead of success? I think it's not behaviorally understanding that life is finite, not just our lives, but lives of our loved ones as well. So we can understand that on, on an intellectual level. But to understand that on a behavioral level uh, is, is really, really important. And so failure is not understanding that on a behavioral level. It's a great answer. Very good answer. So since you're a repeat guest and a friend of ours, you want to stick around and we'll do some of the talking sense cards? Let's do it. We've never done this with a, in a guest episode before. So... I'll ask, I pulled some cards ahead of time because we're starting to get into repeats with Ben and I. So here's a card, we'll let you go first, Andrew. If you could try any job for just one month, what would it be? Personal trainer. Ben? Carpenter. Me would be a lead guitarist. I'd love to be a lead guitarist in a band, a popular band. Okay, Ben, I'll let you go first on this one. Would you, I know the answer to this. Would you rather follow a path laid out for you or set a path for other people to follow? Set the path. Set a path for others. Yep. Andrew? Yeah, who wants to uh, set something or follow something that uh, somebody else's plan entirely? Yeah, we like to think we have some kind of element of free will, right? All right, three for three, I agree with you guys. Okay, Andrew, imagine you have reached your financial dreams. What words would people use to describe you? I hope they would be the same words they would use to describe me if I hadn't reached my financial dreams. So I hope they would be words like kind. We, we've had that question before and Cameron and I gave the same answer in a, in a past conversation. So we're, we're all in agreement again. <laughs> Here's an interesting one. 
I know we haven't had this one, Ben. At least I don't think we have. Some people say that fans, cities, and or players should own professional sports teams rather than individuals. Do you agree or disagree? Ben, you've got a sporting background. Holy smokes. Uh, well, in principle, sure, but that's kind of communism, uh, which, empir- which, which, which empir- <laughs> empirically it doesn't work out so well. So what would professional sports be what they are now? The, the just capitalist, disgusting pig monster um, that people love to watch, which is what I think professional sports largely are. Would they still be the same? Would they be as entertaining under the communist model? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. So I, uh, in principle, sure. But communism in principle, sure too. Just empirically, not not so much. But would people love their teams any more than they do now? I mean, people are crazy about their home teams now. Yeah. Well, in the States and Canada, well, for hockey in Canada, I guess. It was striking to me in the, in the States when I went to play basketball there. Uh, like even your, the university sports is just this, this massive institution and in, in Canada, not a, not so much. Andrew, any other thoughts on that? No, I think I would echo most of what, what Ben has said. Communism in itself doesn't seem to work and it does sound kind of communist, doesn't it? It would be, it would be, it would become so inefficient, I think. Right. And, and ultimately somebody would take control. It's sort of like animal farm. You know, you're looking at pigs around the table. Um, there would be somebody who ends up and ends up taking control. So you come full circle anyway, it's just human nature. And yeah, that's, that's an interesting as, point. And would the experience be as creative? Like I think the whole delivery of these sports has become incredibly creative, both live and on television. Yeah, without the capitalist incentives to to, to do that. Yeah. I don't know. Pro- probably not, but Neat who knows? question. Andrew, this has been a blast. Congratulations again on your book. I think it's terrific. I think it's an important book in addition to being a good book, but uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you guys. It was awesome to, to have this conversation with you guys. And I hope to meet you guys in person. That'd be great.